hey, um, so first of all, don't get intimidated by my, uh, by my title. What we're really talking about here is um, how Swift programs can be slow, or any program really, and then how not to do that. And um, there's so much to say um, that we learn from Swift Neo and other, um, and other Swift programs that I can only focus on one thing today, which is demystifying class versus struct for performance, because that's something I've heard from the very beginning in the Swift community, and um, I always had problems with it, and today we'll cut through a chase and see what's going on underneath. When we talk about performance, obviously, we want to understand what makes programs go slow. By far, the most driving factor is probably the algorithm complexity. As you can see here, if you by accident use an algorithm that should be, um, or if there's an algorithm available that is in like constant time, O of n, by accident you use one that is O of n squared, then you lose, and nothing we'll see later on today will really help you. You need to get your alg algorithms right because that is a very driving factor for performance of um, your program. However, if you got everything right, your program can still not be as fast as you would like it to be, and one of the reasons for that can be overhead. Some of the overhead can be introduced by you, and you will well understand why that happens. For example, if you sprinkle print statements everywhere, sure, that'll make run your program run slow, and that's just constant overhead that's sprinkled everywhere. But in Swift, there's also, or pretty much in any language really, there is also other overhead that the compiler and the runtime do for you without necessarily the programmer understanding what's going on. And Swift is quite like a specific language there, so there's a lot to add with the algorith algorithmic complexity. Swift is, I guess, similar to all the other languages, right? Because that's an algorithmic thing. The overhead can often be slightly closer to the language. Despite working in a Swift Neo team, I'm not giving a networking talk today. However, the examples <laughs> are still picked from, um, from Swift Neo. So the, today's example is an HTTP request. There's not too much really interesting to see. We have got a structure here that is the HTTP request. We've got the method, get, post, and you name it. Target, that's like the path in the URL, everything that comes after the host name. HTTP version, couldn't be more boring than that. The headers, you know what, we're what I'm talking about. The body, in this case, represented fairly um, simply, just an array of bytes. And the trailer, so that, uh, that's a lesser known feature, it's just like the headers, but at the end. Um, this structure is not directly taken from Swift Neo, because in Swift Neo we need to stream everything, because we want to support all use cases, so the body looks different, but it's close enough. The next most important thing is that HTTP request here is a value type, and that's really close to my heart, and I think the Swift community has also learned over the time that value types add a lot of benefit because it makes your life easier, because you know you, you're dealing with basically your own in independent value. You can do to it whatever you want. No one else will be affected. That's great. This example is a very silly one. Let's assume we, we had a dot conferences, we're writing some app, and like we have one URL for the dot Swift conference, and then we want to, do, want to cover the dot AI conference. We make a new variable AI, assign Swift, because we bootstrap everything from Swift, and then we just change the target to dot AI. And obviously, we want that the target of Swift.target still refers to dot Swift. We don't want the AI to take over Swift. But that's really just added. We want to talk about performance here. And in this case, we want to talk about the performance of calling a function transform that transforms a HTTP request. That's something that happens in many web frameworks. Some middleware might get an HTTP request, might transform it, hand it to the next middleware, and so on. So basically, the HTTP request gets passed around in your program quite a lot. To see what effect on performance our HTTP request structure has, I wrote the most simple transform function you can imagine. It's the one that doesn't transform it, just returns it. And then I timed how long it takes to run it. 52 nanoseconds. The absolute number here, 52 nanoseconds, has absolutely no significance. That is, on my computer, on that particular day, with that particular snapshot of the Swift compiler, don't really, doesn't really matter. What matters here, let's just say that the 52. And when benchmarking things, you often need a baseline. What, is, what, is, what am I competing with? And I, I like to benchmark against something that I cannot achieve, like the absolute limit that is basically, or maybe absolutely unachievable. So I guess it's pretty obvious that one of the sim most simple types in Swift is an integer, and a transform function that just transform one, transforms one integer to another will probably be faster to call than our HTTP request structure, because a lot more stuff needs to happen, and we'll see later what. But a different difference is quite big. The factor here is 52. I think it's reasonable to expect that it will be slower, to call a function with a HTTP request and returning it, but 52 sounds a little bit much to me. 
To understand why that is, let's look what the compiler and the runtime will do. First, let's start with the integer. The green box here is our value, 23, our integer. If I call a function, the only thing that, the run that really needs to happen is the, function, uh, the, the value, the integer, needs to be copied in a, the, the right processor register, and we can jump into function. How does that look? Like this. 22, 23 gets copied, and we're really done. But now we want to understand what happens if I call this very similar function with my HTTP request. To understand what's going on there, we need to understand that, they, that a struct in Swift is really like a veneer over a collection of other things, like over the properties, the stored properties. So really, what you should compare is that function is at runtime, much like a function that has all my members as individual um, parameters and a long list of return values. So now it becomes already, already apparent why maybe some more work is going on here. The Swift, you can also ask Swift about the size of, a, of any type, and for this particular struct, it will tell you 64. That means 64 bytes. To make it even worse, however, much of the, many of these fields have uh, variable-like length types, like strings and arrays for the body and for the headers and the trailers. And obviously, at compile time, we don't know the length of them, so their actual values, the underlying strings and, 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 and headers and body bytes, are stored on the heap, signified by, this red, signified, oh God, signified by the red box. That's the heap. And the gray ones are the pointers from these structures, the values, to their backing store on the heap where they store the bytes and all these things. To manage the lifetime of these backing stores, we need a reference count. That's signified by this little pound symbol here, or by the four little pound symbols indeed. And now let's have a look what happens if we copy this HTTP request around. So we pass it from one function and then back again. We only look at the path to enter function, not the one to return. So first of all, we copy the string struct around. And the other thing that needs to happen, we need to bump the reference count. You might have seen this little blue up arrow appearing. Next thing that happens, we copy the version around. That's, again, two words because it's two integer. No reference count this time because it's just two integers. And to speed it up, I animated the last four ones together. We copy another four words, and we bump three reference counts. So what happens in total is we copy eight words. So eight green boxes get moved into this blue thing, and we increase four reference counts. And sure enough, if you increase a reference count somewhere, somewhere else you will need to decrease it. And I guess that explains now why does it take longer to pass this HTTP, struck, uh, HTTP request around than it does take the int around, because the int is literally just one box, and now we need to move eight boxes and four reference counts. And a lot of the Swift server community has seen this problem as well. They did some me measurements, some number came out, and they did some other measurements. That is not a good idea, and I'll, I'll go into why that is not a good idea, but they just changed the word struct to the word class, and did the same benchmark again. What happens at runtime? The struct is really just a box that goes on a heap, and the only thing we need to copy around is the pointer to this class, and we need to increase only one reference count. It doesn't matter what you put in the class, because basically it's get, get box up, put on a heap, and it's there. They do the everyone did the measurements, and 50 nanoseconds. That looks a hell of a lot better than 52. It's almost factor four. And that is where the whole fallacy started, that people say, oh, somehow classes are faster than structs. And that is not true, but you can see how the argument goes, that we have seen the proof. We've done a benchmark. It must be the truth. But it's not quite. Let's see why. So first, let's have a look why do we not want to have a HTTP request as a class? Because it's a value type. It should have value semantics. If we did not do that, so if we implement the HTTP request as seen before as a class to be able to pass it around faster, because that might be important to our program, we lose the value semantics. So in this case, even the, despite the fact we have two variables, AI and Swift, they share, they share the same class reference. So if I change the target of the AI, I'll unfortunately also change the target of the Swift. And that's not what we want. And that introduces a lot of problems with threading. You need to think about when to copy it and a lot of things like that. So what we really want to have is a value, value semantics. But for this particular case, we want to be as fast as the class to pass around, because we saw that it was faster. And now we'll learn how we can achieve that. So we want to have a struct HTTP request, again, because that's the semantics we want. But we want it at runtime, the copying to look like the class in this particular case, because we saw it was faster. Now, can we achieve that? The answer is yes, we can. 
And the step one is really very simple. We create a struct HTTP request, as before, and we move all the stored properties into an inner class we call underscore storage here. The underscore doesn't really mean anything, but it's like, oh, yeah, this is just a container. It's like to maybe makes, makes the program easier to read. I don't know. But at the very moment, our struct HTTP request is very, very useless because it doesn't have any properties. I can't get them. I can't set them. I can't even construct it. That's the step one. So now we get, need to get these properties back. We want to read the target and set the target. Idea one is, OK, that's easy. Let's create a setter. And if I want to get the target, I just reach into the storage, pull the target out, and return it. Same thing. If I want to set it, I take the new target and put it into that storage on the heap, right? Yeah, not, not great idea. At the beginning, it looks like, yeah, it works fine. You know, I got, got an A, my HTTP request. I can assign it, read. Everything works fine. Because in memory, it looks like that. I got my, my one struct, and I got my one storage, one-to-one -one relationship, great. Now some programmer adds a second variable, how dare they, and uh, point it to the same A and change the target. And now we run into a big problem, because again, we have this situation. We have these two structs pointed to the same backing storage. So changing one struct overwrites the other struct's data as well, which is not what we want, because we always just reach into the storage. So that's a problem. So we have seen if we have this one-to-one -one relationship, one the struct points to one class, then we can modify it straight away, because no one else holds a, holds a reference to this backing store. We can just mutate it along. Reading it out is always simple. We just go to our storage to read it out. The problem arises when we have two structs, two values, pointed to the same backing store, and we want to mutate one of them. That is a problem. What we really want to do then is copy the backing store, so we have two again, and then we can modify. Luckily enough, the Swift standard library provides a function with the um, slightly long name is known uniquely referenced to which you can pass a class reference and it will tell you if you're the only person holding this reference or if there's others you're sharing it with. And that sounds like exactly what we want because the left situation, good, we can just write through and everything is fine. On the right situation, where it's known uniquely referenced will say false, we need to do a copy that we get into the left situation. Hope that makes some sense. And implementing that is actually not that hard. Again, as I said, the getter, we just reach out into the storage, get whatever we want, in this case, a target from the storage. But when we set, we need this two, three extra lines. We need to ask, are we the unique owner of this backing store? If we are, great. The if doesn't do anything, we fall through. Self storage target equals new value. We just changed it, perfect. No one else has a reference to that. No one else will see. If we sh should we not be the only owner, also pretty simple, we just create a new storage by copying the old storage, but only when we need it. The copy method is very, very simple, because values compose very nicely. My struct was built out of values, and to copy them, I just need to assign them to a new storage. So the only thing that happens here is I, I allocate a new storage in the heap, copy all the properties over, and that only happens when I need to, when, and that is the case when we have two structs referring to the same backing store. And you might have heard the, the, the phrase copy and write for arrays, dictionaries, strings, and many other Swift data types. And that's exactly what they implement in exactly this very same way. The cool thing is we copy on write if necessary. We never copy and read. We only copy on write if we are actually sharing the backing store with someone else. The cool thing is now we're back to what we wanted. We have our struct HTTP request. And Many slides back, I told you, a struct is really like a thin veneer over um, whatever the stored properties are. In this new struct HTTP request, I only have one stored property, which is, a, which is storage, would happen to be a class. So exactly, that's exactly what we get. We only need to copy one word around. We need to bump exactly one reference count. And we still have the value semantics, because the, through copy and write, we can, we can have exactly the same properties back that we had before. But the copying of this HTTP request is just as fast as copying the class around without losing the semantics we want, which are the value semantics. Again, I did a measurement, and sure enough, 50 nanoseconds bang on. There's nothing, there's nothing different than passing the class around, but to the programmer, there's a massive difference. We have the semantics that we want with the performance that we want by controlling what Swift does um, under the hood. And the API between the first struct HTTP request and this one is exactly the same. The semantics, exactly the same. We don't even notice. The best thing is you can always start out with a simple version. And if performance is a problem, you can change it later. No one will see. It will just work a little bit faster. Some closing thoughts. 
class versus struct is about semantics, not performance. When you choose what a type should be, you should go after the semantics. If you want a value type, it's a struct. If you want, it can also be an enum. If you want reference semantics, it will be a class. You can also make structs have reference semantics as we saw before, but usually that's, that's what, you, what you aim for. The next, point, the next point we should cover is, should I then cow, cow, copy on right, should I cow box all my structs? Should I apply this, this recipe to all the structs I have? Please don't. That is one tool in the toolbox that we might use if it, if it proves to be necessary, but please don't go ahead and make everything a cow box. First of all, so you must have a problem, and then you must find that this is the right tool. The next question we should address is, could the compiler help us? Could the compiler make it automatic, for example? Could it automatically cowbox all the structures for us and we wouldn't even, wouldn't even see that? Um, well, it could, but I would argue that's not a good idea because the cool thing about a struct is it has exactly the same performance at passing everything around that's in the struct, and sometimes that can be faster. At the very, very beginning, we saw this int example. Int happens to be a struct as well, and we saw it was even faster than passing a class around because we don't need any reference counts. So if the compiler decided, oh, I'll just make everything a cow box, it would make many programs slower. So we need to have this control, but only if we see that there's a performance problem. So to wrap that up, first of all, make sure your code works. That's by far the most important thing. If, you, if it turns out that you have a performance problem, go and check your algorithms. That will, by, by, by and large, that will make the biggest impact on the performance of your problem. If you still have a problem, then identify the area and measure. Write a benchmark, and I like to also have um, a baseline, as, as we had before, to see what is like the limit. How, how far can we push, right? Because I had no idea, is it 50 times slower? Is it two times slower? Is it one million times slower, you'd, like, I, I don't, at least myself, I don't have a good feeling. So setting a, ben, a baseline is good. And if it actually turns out that is the problem, like in this case, this HTTP, structure need, HTTP request structure needs to be copied around in the whole program, and that unfortunately performed worse than this, the class, then optimize it, and this is one trick in the toolbox. And I hope um, you now uh, don't believe anyone anymore that says, class is faster than struct, because a class can always be made to be exactly as fast as a class by putting a class into a struct, potentially adding even the semantics for a value type, depending if the type you have at hand is supposed to be a value type or not. Right, that's every, everything I got. I hope that was useful, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>